Good morning. It's, it's good to see you, um, despite sometimes uh, difficult travel arrangements. You made it to Toulouse, so congratulations to all of us this morning. I'm uh, Alexander Redel. I'm uh, working in the team in the European Commission that is looking after digital skills. And I will be your moderator uh, today, together with a, a few of my colleagues who will also act as facilitators, uh, because we have a very interactive session and we are apparently already competing with some other sessions that have just uh, started. So, good to see you. Um, I'm a little bit touched because uh, whether you believe it or not, this is our first live uh, event with people, real people, uh, since 2019 as regards our team. You know, we are, we, I think we've become very good with uh, all kinds of um, virtual events, Zoom, uh, teams, etc. You name it, but we are, I'm really glad to see people without masks sitting here and being able to shake some hands and saying, saying hello. I think I will say a few uh, practical things um, at the beginning now, um, but perhaps let's f first see who is in the room. So we have prepared here something, colleagues have prepared something. Um, so please open your browser and uh, just a second and go to menti.com and then type uh, the code. I hope you can all see the code. Voila. And so we can see a little bit, you know, that really people from all across Europe have come here today, uh, despite uh, the difficult travel situation. I basically crossed the whole of France yesterday by train, sometimes with uh, good internet, sometimes a bit less. It was quite a, a good um, team experience. So we see here, yeah, some people from Belgium, Switzerland, um, from, from Linda also, that's an interesting country, uh, Luxembourg, etc. So very, very good. We have a very uh, international crowd here in the, in the room. And then the second question, I mean, whom do you represent? So what kind of organization are you working for? So we also see a little bit in terms of diversity of uh, uh, stakeholders here in the room. We have some people from, from, from France working in the civil society sector. We have uh, some people working in education, national, regional administration. So I think it's a very nice, balanced uh, thing. And that is also one of the key things that is important for us because we in the European Commission, what we can do is bring people together so that they start talking to each other and sometimes break the silos, create the connections between the silos, which is, as we all know, in particular for for skills development, still one of the big obstacles that, you know, universities, they do not talk as much as they could to the businesses and businesses do not talk as much as they could uh, to, to other people and to government and so on. I also want to, um, in terms of how, housekeeping, say good morning to the interpreters. Thanks for being here as well. And as you saw, there is interpretation actually from English into French and also from French into English. Now, here is a bit like preaching here from the, <laughs> from the stage to you, but what, one thing that is also really important for us today is that this is a very interactive and inclusive workshop, you know, and actually we are uh, not here for us, we are here for you, to listen to you, to get your inputs, to get your ideas. But let me just put things a little bit at the beginning into the policy context, so the policy perspective. What is the purpose of the workshop actually today? So we want to identify the challenges and also identify some solutions to bridge these digital skills gaps that we still see in Europe. Because in my unit, we are also in charge of monitoring how member states are faring in uh, digital. So we're looking, at, uh, we're looking at skills, we're looking at connectivity and so on. And you see, for example, we have uh, two uh, targets for skills in the digital decade, which is basically our big policy document for 2030, where we want to get to in Europe at national level, of course, working together. And you see that the target for 2030 is 80% of all Europeans with at least basic digital skills. And so, I mean, you, you see that today we are you know, in the early 50s, so to say, and if there is no decisive action and going just ahead uh, the way we've been doing over the last years, we'll get to 62% by 2030, which means that still, um, you know, uh, one third of all, or more than one third of all Europeans will be effectively digitally illiterate, which is probably not what we, what we have in mind. 
We also have another um, target, which is for basically advanced digital skills. It is, is the ICT specialists, um, which will a be a little bit, say, the main focus of our session today, uh, because we need these ICT uh, experts. I mean, we, we learned that also during the crisis that all these nice digital applications, all the uh, great technology that is available in, 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 uh, in digital, we cannot develop this technology and we cannot innovate with this technology if we don't have enough skilled people to, to make it happen. And that is basically, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a, a challenge as well. Our target is to have by 2030, 20 million ICT uh, technology, digital technology experts in Europe. And we are currently a bit higher than 9 million. So that means effectively in less than a decade, doubling the number of ICT uh, professionals in a labor market, which is basically stagnating in terms of new people coming from university, from school. So it's a big challenge. And with business as usual, we will, uh, if we just basically do this kind of trajectory from where we are now until 2030, we will be short of 6 million uh, ICT specialists. And actually, you know, this is it's, uh, for, for me something that is also from a personal point of view very important. I have, I have two boys aged 18 and 22. One is entering university, the other is at university, and you ask yourself every week, what should these boys learn actually to make them also employable later, later on to be, you know, um, good citizens, citizens who can um, benefit from, all, from digital technology. And also, uh, you know, this digital technology is, is not some kind of a niche topic where we only have to, to talk about ICT professionals, because most of the jobs that we know today and that we have also tomorrow will require these uh, digital skills. So um, this is a little bit the, the context here. And actually, what, the, what is the commission doing? We've been doing already quite a lot with the Erasmus uh, program that you all know. And there's also now a dialogue that uh, our president Ursula von der Leyen has um, started, which is called, it's a bit of a boring term, but it actually, I think it captures very well what it is. It's called a structured dialogue on digital education and skills. And this is uh, basically a conversation that the commission is having with member states involving also uh, stakeholders saying, actually, yeah, we have identified these problems, we've identified possible solutions. What can we do together and jointly to make it happen uh, at our different levels of decision power and implementation? And actually, this is um, what we are here for today. We will identify some of the challenges hopefully the main challenges, but also solutions um, that we can then bring back to Brussels and that actually we can put on the table and say like these are things that we can do and who has to do what, how much funding do we need, what are things that are perhaps blocking it, who are the people that we have to bring together. And that's why we set up this workshop um, in an interactive manner. Um, we will start with a panel um, with experts that will also put a little bit you know, things into context to understand what are actually the challenges um, here as regards the ICT experts. And then we will break up in smaller groups to identify actually the concrete issues in terms of obstacles and challenges and then come up with hopefully some solutions. I mean, some of the solutions, some of the ideas that you will hear today or that you will develop today are probably confirmations of things that we already have been knowing. And then hopefully there are some new things that are emerging. And that's, you know, I think both is, is fine and both is, both, both is interesting. So, and then we will basically, in a second panel, um, see, looking at these things that have been put on the table uh, with, you know, the distinguished audience, and we have also a member of the European Parliament here uh, and, and many other distinguished panelists here, what uh, we can do at national European uh, level and you know make sure that everything is as interactive as possible and that the panelists can also react to the ideas that have been put on the table so without further ado I would like to invite the three first panelists here to join me on the on the stage it's Josef Landemir who's program manager at the Swedish Agency for Economic and Regional Growth Josef hello and good morning And we also have Anis Gaia, who is head of the Digital Academy of Airbus, a company quite well known in Toulouse and beyond. Good morning. And then I have also Professor Roberto Giovannoni, who is professor of biotechnology at Pisa University and who has still done, I think, a, a thesis defense yesterday in Siena and who traveled also across Europe to be here with us this morning. Applause, applause. Thank you. Voila. 
How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> nice to be here. Let's check whether the mics are working. Is it working? Yeah. Yes. Good. Perfect. So, hello, good morning, everyone. Yes, we have a better gender balance actually in the second panel because there was a, there was a lady from Airbus who unfortunately couldn't make it, uh, but we have two ladies in the second panel. So, that's very important for us as well because having not enough girls and women in ICT is, uh, is uh, as we know, a, a big challenge. So um, let's start, and I want to, to do this very interactive and you know, short, no long statements, you know, one, two minutes uh, in terms of uh, replies. Perhaps at the beginning you have a bit more time because also you need to explain a bit but what you know, your personal experience is on this. So our main overall question here for this first panel will be uh, the lack of ICT specialists um, is really some kind of a call it shared or common issue in all EU, EU countries. So it's not a Swedish problem, it's not a German problem, and the problem is also with the demographic developments that we have just been you know, going to get worse. So what is the main challenge uh, to increasing the number of ICT specialists? And I would like to uh, start this conversation with, uh, with Joseph from Sweden, yes. and um, so you are managing uh, a project where you are actually anal analyzing and providing recommendations on how to increase the supply of high-skilled employees uh, to match demand for this kind of people in Sweden, and uh, you are doing this uh, together with uh, academic organizations, uh, companies, and so on. Can you tell us a little bit you know, how this, you know, what you do there and how this project contributes to solve the problem in Sweden? Yes, of course, and, and the background here is that, that uh, we are, Sweden is a front runner if you look at all the kinds of digital index and so on, but the, the fear of being a sleeping giant put us, on, put us into action here. And we started with this mission to, to benchmark the situation and we can see that I guess almost all of the OECD countries have some kind of strategy working on increasing the, the, the digital competence and the supply of high ICT speci specialists. But it differs in ways in how ambitious this agenda or strategy is. And uh, we can see that in, in, this, in the real big countries like US and China and India, there are massive resources being put into uh, this kind of programs. Uh, and when we started to look into what can we do, what are the challenges here, then we can see that we need to increase funding for education, for universities and research on the area. Uh, this will help the supply of digital cutting-edge experts, of course. Uh, we need to close the gender gap. I look at the E figures that about 9% of the ICT specialists in the EU are women. Uh, this is a of course, a huge waste of brain power. This can't go on. We will be lagging behind forever if this will continue, I would say. Uh, we need to welcome talent to the EU, uh, increase the inflow of talent from outside the EU in a better way. There's a lot to be done there. Uh, employers need to encourage staff and uh, employees to develop their skills during the working life. This will cost money. It's not. It's easy to say, it's hard to put out in practice. Uh, and um, individuals, we as uh, employers need, uh, employees need to, to figure out and take responsibility for our own skills development. Uh, we're not, we, all in this room doesn't need to be ICT specialist, but we, we need to level up as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks a lot. That was already a very good, uh, basically, uh, scoping of uh, of the challenges, and we we feel almost a bit nervous, like going directly to <laughs> the solutions. But we need a bit of uh, of patience here. So thanks. That was uh, a good start. And, and then Anis, I mean, Airbus is a well-known company. We've most likely used all all of us there these products. And congratulations to this A three hundred twenty one XLR super plane that you basically just announced. I think this week. Thank you so much. <laughs> And, um, but also, um, based on, on my previous experience over the last say, 10 years, having worked uh, from various angles at this topic, Airbus is also an interesting employer. Um, uh, you, you won also the European Digital Skills Awards because of your so-called digital skills, uh, sorry, the data analytics uh, learning framework. And which was based on the um, Airbus internal workforce, uh, you know, to see how to get these people data science skills. 
Um, and so it, it seems like you are a company that really also cares about the, your em uh, employees in terms of rescaling and upscaling and investing in these. So um, airplanes are today filled with you know, the most sophisticated technologies. Um, so is Airbus um, an aviation company or is it a tech company? What is it? And what kind of profiles do you currently need most? So thanks for your answer, for your question. So, so Airbus basically and techniques, it's a mean to achieve our goals. So what are our goals? It's basically to be more sustainable, safe, and to be able to connect people everywhere. This is really what is behind. And now techniques is one of the way to achieve this objective. So effectively, what we do is that we strongly believe into this digital skills and competency as enablers. We strongly believe into upskilling and reskilling our population. You mentioned the data scientist and analyst certification and degree, which is a way basically to grow and to become an official data analyst and scientist within Airbus. It's a recognized even out of Airbus. Just to let you know, within the three last years, we certified 1,000 internal employees on that program, which is really a ma major achievement. This happens. Two weeks ago, the third 1001, which got this kind of diploma. And very concretely, in this nano degree, what we do is that we make sure that they design a project that then they can make it applicable within Airbus, within really a clear return on investment, measurable, visible, and then it will help to recognize them as data analysts in their role. The challenge that we face is that for the time being, uh, we are still even if it is a big digital transformation which leaders believe in, we are still at the very experimentation phase when we discuss about data analyst, data scientist, artificial intelligence profile. Why? Because we are still not in the full industrialization of it. Today, this is one of the main challenges. And the other one is how we can push our leaders, basically, to understand that this digital transformation cannot happen if we maintain silos, politics within the company. This is, digitalization is just against that. So it's uh, also, out of techniques, new way of working, thinking, that we need also to put in place. Excellent, I mean, just a very good question, very short answer, please, is these people that you train, I mean, how do you make sure that they stay in the company, they don't leave? Ah, this is a very good question, and today you're fully right. Huh? Uh, we are really in a talent uh, war huh, for the digital profiles. To be fair with you, among the one trend, 20% left the company in total transparency. So you see, it's not peanut. This is why we invest a lot about people retention. How? By recognizing them from salary point of view, but also from development point of view, and also by giving them the field to influence our company in terms of safety, sustainability, and more competitivity, especially towards our external comp competitors. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Um, Professor um, Giovannoni, can I call you Roberto? <laughs> so you are a uh, professor of biotechnology at Pisa University, which is quite well known. Uh, I think also in informatics, they always been um, cutting edge, so to say. Um, and uh, you know, Pisa University is really a leader in teaching uh, digital skills and also provides a number of uh, multidisciplinary courses uh, for students to become proficient users of digital technologies. Um, and you also work a lot with other universities. You're quite embedded with, you know, in a network of, uh, of other EU universities and research centers. And um, do you want to say what you think about this uh, ICT specialist target that we have put there for the digital decade? Is it realistic or is it uh, bogus? Yeah. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so, first of all, thank you. And um, let me say that uh, we have um, a big challenge in, in, in the, of course, in the computer science and data science, but uh, the challenge is, is not that we could not recruit students as much as in other areas, but instead we can recruit students which are not enough for the, any, I mean, for the job need, I mean, for the market need. Um, for example, in informatics, uh, or computer science, we have a huge number of students that are coming, uh, I mean, for starting this, to, to achieve the degree, first level degree, and, but they will not cover, I mean, the, the job market. That is the big issue, one of the big issues. The second challenge that we, that we face is about 
the, 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 the gender issue. I mean, we have, I mean, a, a, a minimal amount of uh, women that are interested in this kind of, um, this kind of, I mean, disciplines. Um, a little bit different in, in information in, uh, uh, engineering, so data sciences, but uh, the, the problem is still about how to recruit students um, in, in, a, in a amount which would be useful for, I mean, cover the market. Uh, the, the point is, in my opinion, that uh, we need to, uh, to, to, mm, um, to reach more students, even in the lower level of education, and to provide them how would be, I mean, their work and with, with, with such kind of, I mean, expertise and skills. Uh, and I'm, I'm just connecting with the, with the last question that you put to to uh, to, to the colleague, and. Uh, in, in computer science, what we saw in PISA is quite a paradox because we have a huge, of, a huge amount of students starting the informatics course, but then they will uh, find their job before completing the study and they eventually abandon the studies because they already have their job. That is, I mean, good from one in one sense, but in terms of the, the expertise, the certified expertise could be, I mean, not as good. So th there are several, I mean, points that have to be uh, um, uh, considered when we speak about, I mean, how to reach the targets. First of all, the access. The access in terms of what, uh, let the students imagine what c could they be in the in their future work, in the future job, uh, with, with that specific skills, I, I think we are quite defective in this in this point. Okay, I mean that is a uh, of course a phenomenon. I think many of us have already seen that uh, there's this war for talent, and then you know the uh, companies, organizations, they go to the university and they poach away the people. You know, even for the universities themselves, and they then the people don't go into PhDs. Uh, it's, it's either or. So the question is later on, perhaps, are there some possible avenues of you know combining both so that people go and work, but at the same time they also continue to learn or con to continue to teach and also educate uh, other young people. Let's perhaps briefly go back to Sweden. Um, so we all would like to have this fantastic crystal ball where we can see in terms of skills, um, intelligence, what will be the uh, occupational profiles, the jobs, the kind of skills that we will need in five years from now, something like that. And there are a number of things where, where we tried also to see a little bit, you know, what are the other developments now in terms of specific profiles uh, so that we can already react. Uh, of course, I mean, we, European Commission, is not, you know, training so many people. But, I mean, what is your experience from Sweden? What, what can be done in terms of skills and uh, analytics? And there's one specific question, a second question also. Can you tell us about these so-called spets competences? Yeah, spets competence. It, it translates better into Swedish, I promise you. It so sounds a, a little bit weird, I guess. But uh, it's, it's a concept where we look at uh, technology knowledge. And techno uh, deep knowledge in tech is the foundation here. But to utilize the opportunities of digitalization, uh, we need to go further. Uh, we see the big opportunities in mixing ICT speciality with other fields, like cross-skilling. Uh, that's when we create and add value to the society here. Uh, our, our favorite example, I, I need to mention that, is the IA, IA Swede of the year in last year. He's a medical doctor, he's a cardiologist, and he created an algorithm who took, took 1,000 uh, patient risk factors into account no doctor can do that in, in, in one meeting. An algorithm. An algorithm, yeah. And with this algorithm, he could uh, predict with like 90% uh, uh, correctness which of his patients who, who need more medical care. So uh, with this algori algorithm, he, he makes life better and longer for a lot of his patients. And at the end of the day, that's this, this is what it's all about. Like creating and adding value with, with the help of digitalization and, and, and the opportunities it gives us. 
So we need more of this, like we need med tech, we need cyber security of course, and, and green tech, and, and legal tech of course, because the biggest obstacle for this medical doctor was to, to work with sensitive data, how to get the permission to do that, and he needed tons of lawyers, and, and it was a long, long process to, to get this uh, data into, into action, mm -hmm. because the, the data exists, we, we all only need to use it. Indeed, indeed. So, so, but, but just to go back to this uh, question, if you were, we were to give you advice, you know, in, in a few sentences, um, skills analytics, uh, yeah. is it possible? Does it make sense? It, it makes sense, of course. If we need, we need better education, of course, uh, and just-in-time education. And what courses do we need? And there, there's a lot of possibilities in the data as well here. We, we, we have worked with data-driven anal analysis and created a tool. It's called digitalskills.se. It's only in Swedish, however, but Google Translate may help you on this one. And they will look at the information that are, there is in, in job ads. Uh, we analyze millions of job posts posted online at the Public Employment Service. And we extract information from this, from this data. And we can see almost in, in real time what, what skills are needed, uh, what job posts are trending, and, and we make predictions out from this. And hopefully we can make uh, better, uh, better training and education possibilities in just in time. And of course, this is an open source project. So copy the code, make your own digital skills uh, tools out there and, and uh, and uh, I think we can get better training and, and courses uh, out there. Okay. And yeah. Uh, but of course, a prerequisite is that the data is open and, and out there and accessible for everyone. Okay. Um, going back perhaps to Airbus, I mean, also skills analytics. I mean, do you have some kind of magic dashboard where you immediately know in real time what are the skills of your staff and how to develop that? Or for sure. It's still a dream, but <laughs> one day <laughs> we'll get it. No, more seriously, this kind of uh, effectively skills are more than welcomed, as you have understood. We also believe that we have other investment in terms of skills. Solution today is out of Airbus, and this is a kind of call uh, for it, which are all the cyber, the security skills, cyber and security skills. So this is really another Eldorado which we must go through, and this is a must security. We know the airplanes, satellites, helicopters are more and more connected, can be hacked, so this is why we really invest strongly into it. We also th believe and in want to invest on the technology specialist profiles, people who master techniques in Europe also. Uh, last but not least, in terms of skills profile, we also strongly believe that architecture, so IT, enterprise architecture skills, are more than needed to optimize our landscape, to make it secure, to make it more sustainable. And we know that this architect profile are also very w looked after within the full companies, institutions, governments, etc. A quick question afterwards, quick response, please. I mean, this data that, that you have in your company, to which extent do you share it with other companies or other organizations? How much is public and how much is basically your own uh, secret? Yeah, let's say when it is related to digital skills, we are as transparent as we can be. Why? Because in fact, by being protective, we don't solve the solution. As you said, it's about communication. So communication to whom? To the universities, to the high schools, governments in a l other measure, which is how we can influence. You remember what you said, I'm a guy, where are the women? Alors, good news, in Airbus for ICT, 40% of our workforce are women. Which is, and our top manager is a woman, but nevertheless, the intention is how we can influence through the education ministry in the different European countries, so really going not in the universities or high school, this is too late, but already from the very beginning, how women can feel more at ease in this digital world, how they can be more confident, how they can consider that this digital transformation is not only about techniques, and this is not something for them. You see, so this is one of the challenges. We don't have yet the answer, but we try to influence it from our top manager perspective. Excellent. I, you can see that all the speakers are very motivated and passionate about these things because they live it actually in their, in their daily life now. Um, going back to 
PISA, um, multidisciplinarity. I mean, that is, uh, of course, also one of the big challenges. I mean, I remember that in the 50s and 60s, there were these system science, you know, that people from different disciplines uh, talk to each other, the maths people start talking to, 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 to biologists and things like that. But of course, that requires some additional heavy lifting because you need to, you know, you already don't have enough resources, you already have enough work to do. Um, how do you manage to, you know, what, what are the obstacles and how do you manage perhaps to uh, go towards this road of more multidisciplinarity as regards digital technologies? Yeah, um, and in, in PISA, but also with uh, other universities with which we are collaborating and, and in, 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 in particular in the uh, um, digital skills, uh, we think that, uh, I mean, the contamination of informatics or data science with other disciplines... Positive contamination. Yeah, uh, is, is, I mean, a sort of uh, improvement and in a, a challenge for both students and, of course, teachers and, I mean, institutions and so on. And this is, but this is leading to a different, uh, I mean, vision in terms of... Uh, if we, um, if we contaminate disciplines, for example, uh, I mean, data, data sciences or computer sciences with humanities or we, with economics, or even in a more specialized field, uh, such as biotechnologies and medicine, um, we think that uh, students and which are the future workers will acquire, will achieve, uh, I mean, more, uh, more specialized from one side, more spe specialized uh, skills, but at the same time, they will also change their mind and they will uh, have a look to what that specific uh, knowledge can be used for. And this is, I mean, in our opinion, a sort of open minded uh, approach. And with with, with these courses, uh, for example, the last one that we activated is in biotechnologies and applied artificial intelligence for health, which, is, which means the contamination between the biomedicine knowledge from one side and the, I mean, advanced skills such as machine learning and art artificial intelligence. So the, the professionals that will be, the, so the graduated uh, uh, person will have, I mean, a comprehensive view on which are the problems and how to solve them with the exact, uh, I mean, uh, techniques, algorithm, and so on. So this is our idea of uh, teaching and how to, I mean, we should revise this, uh, the, the, the old idea of teaching in terms of uh, uh, collaborating with other universities as, as we are trying to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're motivating them also because you show them that uh, this is actually a useful tool for them and that basically they cannot continue. I mean, you know about bioinformatics and all these disciplines which have been around for, for, for a while, but you have all kinds of new interesting uh, crossover uh, disciplines coming up basically. Yeah, and they become skilled, not just in the application of that specific, in that specific field, but I mean, in more in general, because they, they had that specific knowledge and uh, uh, approaches. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, I think we are almost uh, getting towards the, the end, end of the panel. Perhaps we just do a last speed pitch. I mean, we have already identified a little bit what are the key challenges, you know, that the, the, the ladies are also not in enough young people in general going to the disciplines, the, the challenge also multidisciplinarity, additional heavy lifting, so to say, the skills analytics, uh, also to retain the people, uh, make sure that they're reskilled and then they stay and they, they basically grow with the company. Um, Many of these things, they are not so new. Uh, perhaps we I would like to do one last round with you, uh, 30 seconds. You know, if, uh, according to you, you had you know, one thing to put on the table in terms of big innovative challenge uh, to increase the number of ICT experts, what would it be? Sweden first. Uh, <coughs> yes, this is not new, uh, sorry, but, but we need to close the again the gap. Uh, th this would be like, it's not a silver bullet, of course, but it, we've been struggling with this for decades. It's, and nothing is really happening on this front. So if we can today start and, and find new good examples and create new ideas about this, th that would like be a 
concrete and very helpful. I think. Yeah, if I can just tell one anecdote, we have actually um, an initiative called Code Week, which is uh, all across Europe, uh, with uh, run by basically volunteers. Uh, where we have uh, more than four million uh, participants every year, and the funny thing is that you have as much as many girls as is young, you know, boys participating in this initiative. So from basically the, the great, I know from, about from the from the moment of passion here towards the university and then the graduation, we are losing all these girls somewhere in the, in the system because of uh, various reasons that are you know already studied and so on. But still, we haven't found the, uh, the magic solution to that one. What is your golden idea yeah in some words my point would be how a non-it company such as many exist so airbus is one of them we can be more inno innovative in terms of uh, digital skills attraction and retention so this is really one of the general question in which we are for the time being don't have one unique answer but more than ready to to hear about uh, this kind of challenges so you're trying to get something back also for your company from the workshop today Sure, win-win. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> absolutely. Approach. The last word is Roberto. Yeah, um, so the main challenge, in my opinion, or the main, the main point is uh, the access to the students at all level to the to that specific, I mean, knowledge. Uh, meaning that uh, as an academia, we should uh, change our vision and, for example, let students access to not the whole degree program, which could be long, but f specific focused uh, uh, courses, mini courses, that of course should be also, uh, I mean, formally uh, uh, recognized. And this is this needs a, so a, a, an intervention from the EU of homogenization between different countries. But this will is, in our opinion, the way to, I mean, uh, which increase the target uh, of students and did, uh, to to uh, people that access these kind of uh, uh, skills. Thanks a lot. Quite a few ideas for half an hour. So I would like to thank the panelists, and perhaps you can just applaud them for for these ideas. And I, I will you g give you a few instructions what we're going to do now, because now actually you have to work. Um, so don't go. We will just close the door. Um, have a glass of water, and uh, we will have now two basically interactive parts. Um, we will have uh, the breakout sessions, and the first one will be about uh, identification of the very concrete challenge. And so here we will um, so we have to listen a little bit. Um, I try to be as uh, clear as possible, but if any question, I also, also have my co-facilitators here in the room. If anything is un not, not clear, you can ask them what you're supposed to do, actually. So you're sitting at the table. If you think that you have uh, to change tables because you're only one or two people, you can also combine with another table. You introduce yourselves, if you haven't done that so far. You discuss and you share. You exchange and network. Um, and you come up with a maximum of three, not four, not five, one, two, or three challenges per table. And please write down one challenge in big words on a post-it. You have 15 minutes to do so, and then, so again, my colleagues will help you in case you have questions and act as timekeepers. And then after these 15 minutes, identifying the main challenges, I'll tell you what we will do with these one, two, or three, not four, challenges that you have identified per table. Have fun and good luck. So you, you have post-its on your table, you have markers, you have good mood, you have water. If you need anything else, let us know. Hello, hello. I see some people have more than three challenges and are negotiating which ones are the most important ones. So I think it would be good if you could just wrap up and um, put everything that you have already on the wall, and then my colleagues, they will try to cluster the different things that you have found here. I can already see the gender gap is there in the middle, um, uh, recognition of talent, attracting and retaining people, some of the things we've already heard. So, but if you haven't wrapped up so far, please do so. 
and um, then I will explain you afterwards how we will do the, the second session. Very good. Now, of course, we have all done some studies at universities or schools and so on, and so we try to put things together in different boxes, and sometimes it's not so easy, <laughs> as you can see here. Yeah, my colleagues are really doing the difficult part here. They're like, where do we put it? Left, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's one first cluster emerging here on the left hand, and it's about attracting and retaining talent. Also, uh, one point we discussed with Anis from, uh, from Airbus. Uh, how talent and competences can be recognized, how, how to find a specialist on time, time lag to get the right talent in on time, uh, formation continue in French, um, you know, uh, vocational educational training, making sure that uh, you're learning and relearning all the time, which is sometimes a challenge if you don't have enough time and to motivate yourself. Yeah, some last, last po post-its that are still left somewhere? No? Not the case? Very good. So I think we have um, something emerging here. Yeah. I will write the gender gap. Yes, yeah. so we have, of course, the gender gap, not enough ladies in education, training, or in ICT professions. I haven't looked at the latest figures this morning, but I think... Uh, it was around 17% of all ICT professionals in Europe, so one-sixth are women, and it's definitely a big waste also of talent because, I mean, ladies, they have very good ideas also in terms of uh, innovation, uh, in terms of specific professions and so on. This is definitely something we are, we're losing. Um, so the, the gender gap was identified as um, one big challenge to, to work on. Then the next cluster that colleagues uh, identified was um, attracting and retaining staff and also lifelong learning, so keeping people motivated actually once they have learned something to stay in your organization and not basically t take the training and, and, and run somewhere else. So that's a definitely, so what can we do actually to um, make sure that this is happening? Um, then there's one uh, cluster which is really about inclusion and basic skills. Um, who came up with this idea? We, I think we need to qualify it a little bit, what it means in, 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 in practice. Inclusion, basic digital skills. To make a more inclusive digital transition, we need to take into consideration uh, digital vulnerable people who might be in uh, elderly people, uh, minors, people living in rural areas, so basic skills are um, uh, a key challenge to address. So it's very much also about digital literacy, so to say. Okay. Anybody else who made a proposal in, in that uh, cluster and who wants to say, express? I think it's, it's pretty clear. Um, then also an, another one, which is also one of my favorite topics, uh, you know, sometimes seeing what my and how my uh, sons are still studying and learning in schools and universities, it's innovation in education, of course. Um, I don't know whether we have some specific angles there coming from, perhaps we can, on the right hand, okay, so the idea is here and also don't, you know, be shy and come here and, and look at uh, the concrete stuff that was proposed by people is educational structures to change KPIs, so the KPIs um, of universities and, and, and other organizations. Missing link between education and practice, quite well known, you know, um, 
perhaps uh, organizations, businesses not talking enough to universities uh, and, and schools and vice versa. And then, of course, the topic that we had also developed during the first panel, which was cross-skilling, so uh, curricula, ethics, uh, IT and, and, and languages and so on. Good. Um, we have here another cluster which is about cooperation, uh, cooperation and pragmatic approach. So what are the possibilities to facilitate cooperation between the different actors to overcome these um, this, this gaps that we see? Uh, here, we in the, in the Commission, we try to be useful in terms of basically overcoming this call it coll collaboration or cooperation uh, challenge that, it, that people are not talking to each other, that people don't have the right channels to learn, you know, things from, from other people that have been trying this, to do the same thing in another country. And so, uh, you know, what can cooperation bring to overcoming the, the challenges that we have uh, identified? And Silvia, this is, uh, is it the last one? So, Silvia, a bit of suspense. How to encourage upskilling? It relates to the motivation. Okay, so what, what are the incentives that you need to give to employees to, to upskill? You know, the, the time available, the money available, the recognition available, uh, and that you can, you can hopefully then also use the skills that you learn because it doesn't make sense to do, ah, you have to do your three days of training this year, and then you say, like, well, it was not really useful. <laughs> so um, another one. Good, that's it. One more, okay, an emerging table. Perhaps I will just explain you how we're going to run the show now, or well, you're going to run the show for the, for the second uh, breakout group. So we have identified uh, the challenges. And again, perhaps pass by here, so you get also a feeling about what have people been uh, proposing here. And we will take this back and hang it up in Ursula von der Leyen's office in Brussels as the big challenges identified by, by a workshop here in, uh, in Toulouse. Um, now you have to ask yourself the question, and you can stay at the same table, you can also move tables, and we will have one table per flip chart. Um, how to address the challenge that you have identified and solve the issue, and be really very practical, pragmatic, uh, you know, what to do concretely. What, you know, some examples or who does what, who, who has to do it, who has to be active, how to make it happen, how much would it cost if you know about it? Or you know what is the the missing link? And um, so this will be the next challenge for for your breakout uh, session two. It would be good. So you have to choose one person um, who will uh, be the rapporteur of your table, and you use the the flip chart to write down actually these answers to these practical questions. You know what to do, who does what, how to make it happen, how much would it cost if you know. And uh, then we take it, take it from there. And people can move around tables. And uh, also, so the person who is the rapporteur will report back to us afterwards what you came up with. And that is, that is very important, because we have quite a few topics, quite a few tables. So there is a risk that it becomes boring if you're very long. So <laughs> whoever is going to present this at the end, you have to do it in one minute. Be entertaining, you know, do a bit of theater, say, these are the big solutions here. Uh, so that you make it also a bit interesting for, for the people here. All is clear. If it is not clear to you... Does each table... Uh, sorry. Um, uh, does each table... Uh, uh, no, yes, this is the first question, but it's not my question. My question is, do we uh, think to only one uh, poster, one question, or uh, do we address all questions? No, I think it's a, it would be good if only one. I mean, yeah. You have to choose. Yeah, you have to choose the table exactly. Yeah, but you you go wherever you like to work. So you ch you you ch choose the challenge. The gender gender gap is here, and then you ch uh, then we will try also to do a bit of balancing if there's one table that is very full. Funding and evaluation. Sorry, this one I forgot. That's also very important here, is uh, on that table. So you can move around. If you have any questions of practical nature, ask my colleagues. They're here. And sorry that we make you work so much. Have a, have a, have a glass of water, take a coffee. Yeah, very important. We have uh, half an hour. So basically, I'm checking, checking the timing now. It's uh, 10 past 11, nine, 9 past 11. 
So if we can con reconvene here at 11.35, yeah. yes. that would be good. Okay? Have fun and try to enjoy it a little bit. Hello, hello. One more minute to go just to wrap up. Write everything. Don't make it too complicated. And we will go to the debrief of what you've been working on and what you found in terms of solutions. The innovation in education, people are still writing frenetically. The gender gap is being solved as we speak. And um, voila, so every table has somebody who can present the solutions. Yes? Mario has a very sophisticated diagram. <laughs> are you an engineer? <laughs> it shows. <laughs> very good. So I think we are getting ready. <laughs> Good, so you all have also microphones at your table and if the microphone for whatever reason doesn't work, we will find a, we'll find a solution. Um, this is a table, are you ready? Yes? yes? Okay. So what is, you, you, perhaps you just explain Please. a little bit what the challenge is. And the biggest challenge for all of us here is not the ones that we've been writing here, but that actually we do this debrief in, in a you know, short, snappy, and no. inspiring way, so yeah. otherwise people will fall asleep. That's absolutely fine. I promise not to make anybody fall asleep. And if I see you falling asleep, I will come to your table. <laughs> Thank you. Um, our question was, how do we encourage upskilling and motivation? And from the post-its we put back, A, it was very relevant to us, uh, so we stayed in the group, but equally, um, we wanted to expand that a little to look at where you start motivation. Um, so what we actually asked ourselves is what, what is, what is the issue, what can we do? And what we said was important is we need to demonstrate how important and critical digital skills are at basic and upskilling level and will be going forwards, and how important the role of educators, all educators are, in conveying that message, in bringing it alive. So it's, we realised that it was the who in this was important. It's actually the educators, but not just academic educators, but the educators in industry. And, we've, and we very clearly understood between us that there was a big gap between those two worlds, too big to actually make this thing begin to really run as its own, as its own way of life. So what we wanted to do is understand how we motivate within ourselves because it's, the motivation comes from the individual. It doesn't come from the company. If it's not embedded in the individual, it won't become a virtuous cycle. And we looked just briefly as well at um, how technology should actually be a means to encourage and motivate upskilling in its own right. So use technology to actually create upskilling in technology, making sure we really embrace immersive technologies augmented technology, etc., and therefore make a new way of life around our own digital skills, our own digital portfolio as an individual, which made us come up, just in case this sounds boring, for those of you that remember the old board game, we have created the digital game of life. And the digital game of life starts here with the entry motivation of basic digital skills, why you, uh, there needs to be a motivation in the individual to go down this path. If you go down this path, it's academic educators and developers in research that give you that first flavour. So these people understanding the motivation and encouraging and promoting that is important. When you then leave education, maybe not even with the qualification, as we've just heard, but you move into industry with the job, the upskilling needs to be yours and motivated against your career, against value which goes to the industry, the in sorry, one, 30 seconds more maximum. Um, the industry developers then take on that role. And it's a joint role. Because unless what's happening in industry is fed back into academia regularly, then the academic qualifications become less relevant.
So these two points are essential to create a holistic thinking mechanism between both the individual, the company, and the academic. And if people see, it's young students, young people, lower down education, see that game of life working, they want to start go. That gives us the answer to the skills gap. Thanks a lot. I mean, it, whoa, <laughs> congratulations. I'm sure you're already trending on the social media when all the colleagues who took this up. And I, oh, this is exactly what we wanted to get, actually, uh, from this session. I mean, we've managed somehow, at least, you know, as regards the result of this table here, to, to get these ideas and, um, you know, concrete suggestions here. Um, colleagues, shall we just go to the second table? You want to make an announcement? Because also colleagues are a little bit writing down the things that we... You're summing up? Okay. So basically, you're summing up? Just a second. I'll bring the microphone to my colleagues so that they can speak. Thank you, Alex. Sorry for that. Yes, that's exactly what we wanted to show. Can you? Uh, we have our colleagues in the regie as well, and we are summing up. So while uh, your rapporteurs are telling what has happened at the table, we are actually writing it live in this mirror board, and you will be able then to access the mirror board together also with the report from today. So just uh, this is actually the summary of table one. So you know we go with inter interactive. Alex, too. Yeah, thanks a lot. And this is, of course, a simplification because also what you put there, uh, it, again, we will put it in Ursula von der Leyen's office because it's a uh, really very useful <laughs> and pertinent uh, solutions here. Let's go to the gender gap. Um, and uh, if, you are, if you're ready to do your pitch. Yeah. Voila, here. Yeah. Microphone works. Yeah. Ready for the karaoke. Yeah. Thank you very much to, to my colleagues for, for, the, for all the, 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 the inputs. Well, the, the, uh, if we want to, to fight the gender gap on tech, it's not only on tech, it's in society as, as a whole. The problem is that in tech it's, it's, it's even worse than in other parts of the society. So we have to take into consideration from one side, or we should work on the supply side working with, with girls. We will say also later on also with boys, not only with girls, with, with women, just to make them to choose those uh, careers and those studies. And also with the demand side, just to, to see what's going on on these tech industries, why they are sort of male friendly and not female friendly. And also with the environment, institutions, and regulation as a whole, just to, to, to change uh, uh, um, regulations, to make policies, and also um, to, to change uh, uh, culture in, in, in general. So the first uh, thing we, we think it is important, and it's not only related to tech, but again, is, is for the whole of society, is to fight stereotypes, gender stereotypes, in a very holistic way. Not only at school, uh, uh, we know also that in family, but also especially media, in culture, in social networks, that is also educating our girls and our, and our boys. So we, we should then to, to tackle this fight in stereotypes in education, in expectations, what they think, which roles they think they will achieve, and in real opportunities. Because if um, we are changing also our choices all the time, if uh, we choose something but then we see that it's not our place, we will change, we will go to another place. So why we were saying that we were losing girls some women all, all this like pipeline all over the way, obviously, because it's, it's if you, you say, but that's not for me, I take another choice. So we really need to, to work in a very holistic way all the, all the time. And an important thing we, we, we reach the, uh, an agreement is that we don't only need to work with girls saying, oh, you should go to tech, you should go to tech, we sh you should go to tech, because the rest of the society is saying they, uh, how pretty you are to be a princess. So uh, probably what we are saying to them is that you have to choose what you don't like, because we have not socialized you to do that. So we could be doing something very wrong on that. So we have to work also with boys as well and to tell and also to tell them how important is also other parts of the society to care for people, to look for social goals and all these sort of things. So we have to work with both unless if we only work with girls saying how important is they, how important is they, we will not achieve anything unless girls to, to feel more insecure, which is already the problem because the problem, all the studies saying that it's not the girls do not have 
uh, digital competencies is that they feel less confident about their digital competencies. So we really need to make them more confident, and this is important. And also we need that because we are talking all the time uh, that we cannot lose uh, female digital talent, but we are also in a very deep demographic transition with a deep care crisis, and we cannot lose also uh, male care talent. So we really need to, to educate our boys also on that, and not only in girls on talent, only that, like this we will really fight uh, uh, stereotypes. A way also to do is, is as we were saying before, this, this cross-disciplinary, this, this cross-cutting, is also digital literacy. We really need everybody to, to, to it's, 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 a, it's a new literacy wave. It's like in, in the 19th century, we teach people how to read, how to write, and now we have to, to teach the whole society how to read and how to write in a completely different way, in a digital way, and that I think we or we think that many, will many, help. Many things. But change it. Uh, well, we, we need to change in the demand side uh, the dominated uh, work environment that are uh, male uh, friendly and not female friendly. All the boys club and network, which is uh, important uh, as uh, as well. And obviously to make social services, time use policies to balance work and, and life for women, but also uh, for men. And a very important thing that and that's the last one really. Um, meaningful uh, careers and social impact also in tech for a better world. Because uh, in, uh, we know also that we are losing also women in tech because, to, for instance, also to, to, to study math is to go to finance. When to study math was to go to education and to, to, to really to make a social impact, we, we have a lot of women. And now that they are going to finance, which probably is not perceived as a socially uh, uh, good impact, we are losing women. So we really need Thank to, you. to full uh, uh, social meaning. Sorry. Lina Galvez Munoz, it's very difficult <laughs> to stop a, a passionate member of the European Parliament when she's in one of her favorite topics, so to say. Thanks a lot. We'll go to the next um, group, and uh, perhaps if you can really try to wrap up in like one and a half minutes, uh, the other groups, that would be great. You have your microphone just behind you. I hope it works. Okay. Is it working? Yes. Yes. So I won't tell you everything, but uh, innovation uh, in education. About the innovation in education, some points. Uh, an idea would be to introduce sessions of teaching within the education uh, uh, journey, so that we can the people could teach to learn and learn to teach. Uh, other idea is that probably something that uh, frighten, can frighten people where, where, wherever they are students or in the, in the working in companies is that maybe there are too much screens. And so we have to think about mixing more uh, screens uh, and uh, other social aspects, other aspects, what I ca could uh, call natural aspects. Uh, also, we have to make it attractive for students. One of the way to attract students would be to pay them if they go in that kind of studies. Uh, and but also uh, introduce other things, uh, socialization aspects. I come back to that. Uh, interdisciplinary courses. Uh, internship enhancement uh, and sooner in the courses, um, more degrees of certification during the course of their studies. That's all for me. Okay, perfect. I mean, innovation education, uh, lots of uh, really innovative and creative ideas here. So thanks, uh, thanks a lot. It's a big topic. And then we have uh, the next topic, which is about something we already mentioned today. It's about attracting and retaining uh, actually a lifelong learner mentality, attitude, approach. Tell us. Yes, so two, basic, two, two challenges, attract and retain. So for attracting people, we are thinking that uh, it is necessary to develop work studies contract. Uh, we are thinking that it is necessary to develop digital culture everywhere and uh, that uh, there is a need to attract by application, usage, and not only by computing science and coding when speaking about digital. Regarding retaining people, we were thinking that uh, we need to ensure certification or cognition 
at work. We are thinking that uh, we need to give means for dedicated individual uh, projects, digital projects to conduct uh, either within an enterprise or outside um, its, um, the, the working uh, environment. We need to allow risk taking and we need to have uh, access to digital training all along uh, our life and not necessarily our working life. Thanks a lot. That was very to the point. Um, now, funding and evaluation. Mario, what do you have to offer? Okay, thank you. So, uh, money are always the first thing. So, no money, no honey. There will be nothing much done in the world uh, without, without money. Of course, we still expect employees, employers, uh, and the governments to be very effective and very helpful. What we think is that uh, they should work together and also collect money together. So, uh, because we all know that if we as employer ask our employee to go to education, even we pay for it, we even give, give uh, free time for it, the employee usually takes it as granted and half sleeping, half listening in some cases. So it should not be an order from employer to employee to, to go for, for training. Better we agree, so this is this. This is the agreement between employer and the employee, maybe with the help of consultant to find individual learning paths for digital skills of the employee. And if the government is not stupid, we'll invest as well. Because if the employee will imp increase its, his uh, or her digital skills, the effectivity will grow, the salary will grow, the taxes will grow, the money will come back uh, to the government. So this is the triangle of, of funding. And easily about evaluation, what we see, every one of us also here, overestimate our own digital skills. That's why we should move from self-assessment to real testing. It's not easy, but uh, when you are very happy with what you think you know, then you get the real test result. You are not that much happy. Maybe you are motivated to improve the skills. And of course, it's important that this improvement of skills conform to what you want to do in your life or in your job. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mario. I can confirm what Mario just said, you know, with a smiley and the not so smiley person, because we, we see this actually from practice when, you know, that people systematically overestimate their digital skills when you ask them about it. Good. So we have the next table, which is about cooperation and pragmatic approach. Again, keep to the time. Otherwise, we will be still here until three o'clock in the afternoon. But uh, Get going, please. Thank you. So there's so some cooperation here. We want to go, each of us, one by one, just really quickly. Um, so indeed, the topic, cooperation and pragmatic approach to that. And also speed of change. We are all aware how fast the ICT industry is changing and, and how the universities may have a hard time keeping up with, with that um, speed of change. So. Um, uh, from, from myself, I'd say that uh, we should leverage the existing ecosystems. We have uh, Industry 4.0, we have smart cities full of um, really intriguing use cases and, and, and needs and challenges also for the ICT space. We have the public, private and academic sectors um, already organized in these ecosystems. And so we should um, leverage basically those existing um, um, value networks. Okay, continuing with the pragma pragmatic approach. So if you have a kid growing up, um, they don't know what the challenges of the real world are. So um, what you need to do is motivate those kids by telling them what are the big goals we want to solve, like, I mean, clearing ocean from, uh, the, the ocean from plastic or something like that. So I think what we need is a, a public, um, for example, website that tells what our common societal goals are such that people can start uh, working towards those. And uh, I think this goes with the next aspect. So. Yeah, and to complete, we were thinking about one annual event, such as the one that we are doing right now, at European level, in which we have universities, companies, governments, all in one location, thinking about one key action to implement versus digital challenge foreseen. What we said is that we don't need funding for that. We don't want to go to bureaucracy just to have one year to get the funding. What we either need to think about is how to recompensate, how to have a price to win for the 
actions which have been really implemented and within a return on investment foreseen for one of the digital challenge. Maybe as a follow-up to uh, what you heard before is that we, we actually had just one word on one of the green things, which is trust. And how do you generate and how do you create that type of a trust in order, for instance, the policy makers, academia, and then on the business side also come together and actually guarantee that there is less of red tape, more uh, easier access to funding, and at the same time, the clock speed is closer to the reality so that we don't get stuck with uh, with issues that are related to, for instance, getting the funding to new startups in that sense. Uh, the mini Silicon Valley is a bit of an inflated term when you think about that, how do you build artificial communities? And that's not the way that we are proposing. We're actually proposing that you start from one context, take smart cities, for instance, and then you bring together in a very close proximity the, um, the right people, that are then able to take the action and actually generate that trust between the people. And I, I used to be a venture capitalist myself, so uh, in order to do the investment, uh, the, the key thing, as we all know, were the people. And that was the team that was actually behind the startup and not the business case, usually. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, just one approach to combine the pragmatic approach and the studies. Um, maybe you should implement more of the dual systems or the dual studies where students go to university for three or four months and back to, after that they go back to the company, work there for three or, months, three or four months and also take the speed of change back to the universities. Okay, I think that's it. Thanks a lot. Um, perfect, you know, lots of good ideas in terms of uh, cooperation. <laughs> yeah. Um, I propose we go to your th table last because it's about the, this kind of the basis, uh, the foundation, so to say, and that we uh, go to this table now. Um, if possible, at all, keep it to one minute. I know it's difficult, but... Uh... <laughs> yeah, can I take this? Thank you. Um, so when we looked at it, our table uh, looked at it and said, most of the problems we're trying to solve were problems of the industrial age be it supply and demand and so on and so forth. You come to a factory to work, then you go back home. The digital age is actually about fluidity. It's about fluidity of skills. It's about fluidity of people. It, you don't, it doesn't really matter where you are. You're solving a problem. So what we said is what we are creating are, we do not really want pure IT professionals, but we are creating citizens for the digital age. There are three elements to that. One is how do I have how do we have an understanding of what the digital age means, what digital means, there's a skill level there. Inclusion, which is something that we have heard from pretty much every table. And motivation, why do I need to do that? And so on. Everybody knows why we need doctors. I don't really know why I need to learn Python and recursive algorithms. So there are four pillars to it. One is go younger, go down to school after school. Bulgaria has a great example that we learned from today. Uh, something around there, go younger. Real life cases of people as digital skills ambassadors uh, solves one of the other problems that we have of attracting talent from overseas, I'm one. Uh, you come in there, you participate in the community, you integrate, you share learnings, you go to schools. Third level is awareness raising at all levels, uh, not just schools or workers, but citizens at large, older people, young people, whoever it is, and not just about I'm 70 years old, I have learned to use Skype, I am now a participant in the digital age, it can go much deeper than that. But what we are aiming for really is self-sufficiency and self-motivation so that you continue to teach yourself and learn yourself. Anybody who's bought a new phone knows that you've, there is a learning curve, that is a motivation, but you have self-sufficiency. That's what we had. So what you're trying to do is create citizens of the digital age who are self-sufficient and mobile. Many, many, many thanks. So we, so we come to the last table and we'll actually catch up the slight delay that we have now in panel two and in the, in the wrap up, no problem with that. Uh, we come to the foundational part, inclusion, basic skills, the holy grail. Tell us what you have to tell us. Bueno, I'm gonna try to compensate. Uh, basically, we have really gone to the basics, in basic skills. So first is connectivity, infrastructure. If we don't have this, we don't have blood for, 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 really, for, for, for the digital inclusion. So. This is the first. The, th the second is really a real cooperation or collaboration at multi-stakeholder level. So civil society, but also NGOs, 
local governments really important, not, not a centralized system, but a decentralized system for, for, for really training people, corporate the, 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 the involvement of the private sector and the cooperation with pub public sector. This is quite important for really for giving basic skills and include people through basic skills. And then, uh, and finally, granular plus standardized training. So granular because we, we, have, we should give people the, the, the training they need and, 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 and it, it could be different uh, uh, from, from if the people need different, different training, but at the same time with some kind of standardized, and standardized solutions and open source solutions and, 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 and not uh, giving different uh, solutions and too complicated solutions for, because we are again uh, talking about basic skills and inclusion. We have a talk about the definition of, of the, the concrete definition of targets in a school, again, uh, in companies, small micro companies, uh, it's really important how to train people in, 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 in micro companies. We have also uh, talked about learning by practicing, really important, and also very important, the, the, again, the kind of type of, of solutions and the time. People could uh, need or maybe should need sometimes a long life learning, but sometimes it's the, the question is to give a concrete solution in a moment in time. And of course, accessibility. So, thank you. Thanks for doing this so, so quickly. Whoa. I don't know how you're doing, but I feel like overwhelmed by all the density of information that we've just received. Whew. So perhaps we let it sink for like half a minute before we go to the, uh, the second panel. And also here in terms of you know, uh, basic skills and the foundations, uh, there are so many uh, great initiatives around Europe uh, you know, where it's just worth looking how are they doing it and can be absolutely implemented. In your region, in your country, there's MUDA in Portugal, there is you know, the public libraries are doing lots and lots of things. Um, and I, I think all of us, of course, we, we should become uh, digital skills ambassadors to the extent, to the extent possible. Good, listen. We'll breathe a little bit and we'll just go now to, to panel number two, um, how to bridge digital skills gap in Europe, uh, name of our workshop, where also um, uh, our distinguished panelists will say a little bit what they think about the solutions that have been identified. And so I would like to join me uh, in the panel, um, Lina Galvez Munoz, uh, who's a member of the European Parliament, vice chair of the ITRI committee, here on the stage. Applause, perhaps a little bit for, for Lina for making it all the way from Sevilla. Um, I also would like to inv invite Samia Goslan, who is the Director General of uh, Grande École du Numérique. Hello. And Mario Lelowski, who is actually um, basically the man behind the Slovak Digital Skills and Jobs Coalition and Vice President of the Slovak IT Association. So please, as you like, as you like. Very good. I'm just, I will check a bit the time. Yes. Sure. We have prepared a few questions, but um, perhaps it would also be good just to say like, well, what do we think about the, the stuff that was proposed here on the, on the different topics? I, I don't know whether I can perhaps start with you, with, with you uh, um, because you are quite an experienced um, MEP or politician or uh, many, been doing many things uh, and also doing reports in the European Parliament particularly. Uh, for example, on uh, questions related also to Euro Europe's competitiveness in the world, but also on uh, you know women in tech and digital inclusivity. I mean, what do you think about the stuff that you heard today? Well, th first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting me here. Uh, it was a lot of fun, I have to say, more fun than in the parliament. <laughs> And uh, even I have, uh, because normally in the parliament we have only one minute, but they are very strict and you were not. So I really thank you <laughs> about it. They just uh, don't allow you to, to, to talk more than one minute. So it was, it was really very interesting. And um, I think this is the kind of uh, things we really need to, to do to put many people different different backgrounds. I mean, the, what you were saying just there, just different stakeholders to cooperate and to, 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 to come together because I think that's the, the only way we, we because everything is, is, is changing so fast and uh, it's so complex that at the end really we really need to, 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 to see the, the same thing from many different angles and point of view in order to see how complex it, it is and to, to find out uh, complex solutions as mm -hmm. well that mm -hmm. maybe could be easy but are complex in a way. 
Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, from, uh, based on the, on the dossiers, on the reports, uh, the topics that you are working on, I mean, why is this an important topic for a member of the European Parliament? Well, it, it, is, it is important because I think if we want to keep um, uh, Europe united, um, we really believe in our project. Uh, we really need to reach this um, strategic autonomy we, we know we don't have. I mean, uh, during the, the COVID-19, we realized that we were very weak on, on digital, also on, and on industrial production of certain uh, aspects that really need to go also through uh, a digital uh, transition. And now also with uh, Ukraine war, we, we, we have um, seen also how vulnerable are we are regarding energy and, um, and also uh, agriculture uh, production and so on and so forth. And also for all that, we really need this digital transition and this digital uh, revolution. And in order that to, 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 to achieve that transition and uh, a transition to be just, just including all territories of, from Europe, and uh, we really need to, 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 to work not also, also only on skills, uh, but also on digital literacy, because we really need also all talents, not also tech, specifically tech talents, but also we need the other talents also to, to, to speak this digital uh, language. And uh, unless we do that, we will also lose geopolitically our place. Um, that will risk also our way of living and also our democratic values and also the, the, the European project itself. So I think it's, it's, it's really essential. And in order to do that uh, digital transition, we need people to make it happen yes <laughs> thanks awesome. a lot yes yeah. okay great um that was a bit like the, the big political context and going into uh, things which are very concrete also in, in terms of you know having real results samir goslan you are the director general of grand école du numérique uh, you have done an impressive number of uh, trainings already for people to basically reskill and upskill. You've also put in place this observatoire, basically checking a little bit what are the real needs, uh, perhaps on the labor market there. I mean, if you look at what you've heard today, I mean, what uh, are things that uh, have impressed you most or that are, you know, have been most uh, relevant to the work that you do in France? Um, I think what uh, we all share, that we have uh, um, the right insi insight uh, to analyze the, sit the, right, uh, the situation right now, and uh, we come up with solution. We come up with um, solution that uh, sometimes have, have been already uh, been concrete and uh, ready to, to 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 work in center in certain area, for example, in France, and with Grand École du Numérique, this. Um, uh, uh, the, the, this came up with this initiative launched by the government in 2015 uh, to help company to face the lack of competency in digital sector and to train people that are not supposed to be trained in this sector. Uh, young people without any background uh, academic, uh, women that are underrepresented in the digital sector and also people living in what we call the disadvantaged neighborhood and uh, it was like um, uh, like a, like taking a chance because uh, how could you believe that people that he, that we didn't finish his high school or her high school could be uh, working in IC, ICT professional after 11, 10 months or 11 months uh, in uh, training and it's it's something really interesting uh, that uh, grand école du numérique uh, prove that it's possible to, to train people to, to, if they are motivated, it's important, if they are motivated, and to help them to find their place as ICT professional in company. And, uh, and that's it's interesting. Okay, can I ask you a quick question? So you have been quite successful in a number of trainings, but also in the results achieved. So how many people yeah. went into employment? I mean, I could say, this is great. And there are many other fantastic examples around Europe where, you know, is it only money just to multiply or to grow? Or, or in what is missing? Do you have enough trainers? Uh, how can you scale up what you've been doing? In fact, uh, the, the business model is uh, to seed fund training organization if 
they came up with the in, um, training, digital training, with innovative approaches that target uh, people that we want to be trained. That is the, um, it, we see it funding, that we only funding uh, for, for one or two sessions of training, but uh, they have, they ask for accreditation, La Belgian, and this accreditation is during three years. So we they have a evaluation and follow up and help them, helping them to, to, to find the people that want, have to be trained, to train them correctly with the innovative approach and to help them to be really close to the company needs. A company came in master class, company participates to create a curricula, company participates uh, of uh, proposing uh, studied case, concrete case, to work with the learner. The, in fine, in, in, the company hired the learner because they are, they are really skilled uh, as, they, as they need to. Mm -hmm. So you have also managed to go from some kind of a push thing where you need to push the companies into a pull and saying, hey, this is actually interesting. For yeah, the yeah. Push the company to be open to the diversity, uh, people without a background, ac academic background, without uh, having a diploma in engineering school, uh, from engineering school, but also uh, 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 motivate people, uh, our learners, to really uh, choose uh, I, uh, ICT training and uh, to, to, to be aware that it's something that offers them opportunities and offers them the possibility to, uh, to fulfill their life and to have a, a career that's in uh, that's evolve in digital sector and the digital sector of a lot of opportunity, uh, right salary, good salary, uh, and so on. Okay, well that brings me nicely to Mario, who has been uh, relatively successful in the Slovak Republic, also um, coming more from a company angle, because you are the, uh, the vice president of, of the Czech IT Association, uh, to uh, see what is in for companies actually. I mean, of course companies say, yes, we need these skilled people. What can we do to bring everybody around the table? I think these skills coalitions are very much about like bringing the different stakeholders around the table. I mean, we had this topic, cooperation, pragmatic approach, and identifying actually what kind of competences do we need and what do we need to do in order to, to reskill and upskill these people also because, I mean, for Slovakia it's a particular challenge. We're not only talking about the IT sector because you are part of the important European manufacturing bases and, you know, if we want to not only replace people by robots and, and you know, automation, you need to reskill and upskill. So what are your key insights bringing the ideas that you saw today with your own experience? Yeah, thank you. Uh, in uh, 2014, also European Commission and ma all around media started to communicate the, the words uh, digital transformation. Most of the companies had no idea. Every, most of them thought about that this is just that we will put new ERP systems, we will change our administration with, uh, with more uh, office uh, tools uh, and, and that's it. Of course, this is not the truth. The digital transformation of any of enterprise, I mean, from school through industry towards social activities, everything will be digitized. And uh, we wanted to create awareness from all kinds of enterprises and we went, uh, went through the Slovakia a tour, six days in six cities, and we made presentations and conferences explaining what is a digital transformation. First, we had, in first days, we received very few visitors from company leaders and company owners. So I personally called to some of them, we went to a city, and uh, why, why the hell you don't come to listen? We came to you. We right? don't have to go to the capital city or, or so. And they all said, no, no, this is not, not much disturbing me. This is something like the wave, and the wave goes over, and I, I stay untouched. It's not my problem, so this, these buzzwords, digital, blah, 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 it was here before and it will go over. So we recognized that the first issue is that there is no enough awareness of digital transformation processes and also human capital to be digitized by the owners and entrepreneurs. And if you look at the politicians, this is even less. So everyone knows that digital is important. Every one of us is here because of digital. We eat, we sleep, we, we work, we live with digital. 
but I still think it, uh, and it's important that we uh, meet together and we talk about it, that still I don't see enough awareness from the top. And if there is not enough awareness from the top, from, from policy leaders, from uh, leaders of the company, entrepreneurs, and how would you expect all others uh, to, to join? And that, that's why we created Digi National Digital Coalition for Digital Skills and Jobs. I went to the Prime Minister of, a co of the country. I said, the country will bankrupt soon if he will not fight digital. Yes, he accepted. The one we have today, or before, we have now a new one. The one in the middle, the, he completely forgot dig digital. I have to say, this is totally disaster if you have a prime minister who has no idea about digital, and he even uh, publicly claims that he never used mobile banking, he never used credit card, and the question he received at the digital forum, what do you think about young people in Slovakia and digital skills and digital era? He said, young people want to be on the beach. <laughs> so with such policy leaders, uh, you hardly can, uh, can survive, so thanks. We have now a new new prime minister, which who is more digital, but still not enough. Okay, I mean, young people do want to be on the beach, but they, they will complain very soon if there is no mobile coverage. You know, and that's why also you, I think one of the best stories that we have in Europe is that the young people on the beach they don't have to pay roaming fees anymore. <laughs> okay, I mean, uh, going back to the European level, to the political leaders, I mean, this topic of digital skills, uh, we, we've heard it before, is really also a, a challenge for coordination, bringing the different people together, uh, also from the different levels. I mean, education and, and skills and, and training is very often something that is happening in Europe, and it's not bad, at local or regional level, uh, including in countries such as you know Belgium, Germany, and Spain. And um, But then some people say, yeah, but what can we really do uh, in Europe, or at the European level, in terms of making sure that uh, we do something concretely by bringing together the people, making sure that our funding programs are uh, basically addressing the right uh, topics. Do you have a specific view on that one, what we should be doing or what we should continue to be doing? Well, um, everything the, within the European Union is a challenge on, co co on coordination, <laughs> I have to say, because it's, it's, it's something different, it's something there is not other European or other Union similar in the world. So that we have the, 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 the Commission, the, the Member State, we have the Parliament, and then we have the society, we have uh, stakeholders, and it is really difficult to, to coordinate. I think the, 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 from the, the Commission, the, the Parliament, and the, the, the Council, so the European institutions, we are doing really great effort for the European skills agenda, and also uh, for in, uh, to, to, to do this uh, digital transition. I think there is a lot of money and a lot of policies put on this goal, but obviously a, a, a lot of, there is a great challenge to, to, to coordinate all the, the different member states, be, basically because not every single member state is in the same situation. There is a lot of inequalities among member states, and there is a lot of inequalities within each one of the different societies. We have been talking about inclusion, we have been talking about inequalities, we have not uh, mention digital poverty, but it's something we are dealing with uh, the, at the European Parliament. And uh, so this, this really, uh, there is a lot of inequalities and it's, it's really difficult to coordinate because we have to tackle uh, all, all that uh, issues. And, um, and there is a lot of uncertainties. That is also something we have to, to, to have in mind because all these changes are, um, are taking an exponential, or are being, yeah, we, we live in an exponential age in a way. And this is bringing an exponential gap in skills because uh, there are uh, new professions that already have been demanded in different places, and we are not training people still on that. So there is, and there is a huge also exponential gap in regulation. I mean, uh, because the world is going faster than our possibility to regulate because we have to do with warranties and we have to, to coordinate. So really, we, we, we need to improve 
this coordination. But one important thing that uh, I, I think um, is worried uh, us a lot is that uh, when we are taking uh, um, European level policies, uh, we could risk to to favor some member states than others, and we really need to, to tackle that and to combat that, because if not, and especially with the skills, what worries a lot of people is that we could end up having a brain drain from certain parts, sort of more underdeveloped parts, to more developed parts. And this is something that is, um, well, it will not be the best solution, not for European citizens, neither for the European Union as a political project. Mm, yeah, you're, you're touching upon a very relevant and thorny subject because we, you can already see that you know in Europe over the past 20 years there were some migrations from one country to others, you know, going uh, people from Romania, uh, you know, also to Silicon Valley, by the way. Uh, and um, this is this is a, a fact. So the question is, it's, it's a bit of a how to say nobody can lose game. Oh, sorry, no, but nobody can win game because also I mean in, in Luxembourg for example Luxembourg has had a university not for too long and they were basically importing people from Germany from France and from Belgium and of course these people were uh, missing then on the labor market in these countries so it um, you know it's, it's really this awareness that it's a col uh, collaborative approach and also um, um, uh, challenge collective absolutely um, perhaps you have a story to tell us about uh, Ukraine I mean Slovakia has a common border with Ukraine, and there were already quite a few Ukrainians working in the in the IT sector or in companies in uh, uh, in your country. I mean, what we saw recently has it had any impact also on the labor market there, or any any things to be be told? Yeah, of course, uh, Slovakia is a neighbor of of Ukraine. Uh, we are facing the war, war quite uh, on daily basis. I have at home also the family from, from Ukraine, living in our parents' home. So uh, Slovakia is quite much affected. But talking about the ICT specialists uh, and the brain gain and brain, brain drain, uh, we have recognized uh, about five, six years ago that uh, there is quite heavy and massive brain drain from Slovakia to the western part of, of Europe. Uh, which is okay. Some people say that 2,000 of years all the people move from east to the west, but I, now I don't like it with, with the ICT specialists. We do not have them enough anyway. So we have to, uh, we, we try to discuss with universities to grow up with the numbers of, of, of students. No change, no chance so far. Uh, so we went to, to Ukraine, to our closest partner, to, to have a look. So when I end, when I went to Ukraine six years ago, we visited about six schools, universities uh, producing, producing, uh, yeah, creating uh, ICT specialists. They have told me, yeah, we are, by annually, we are producing 20,000 ICT specialists in Ukraine, and only 10,000 of them can find job in ICT. Take what you want. Okay, so we, we, we started to do some, I would say, reasonable activities, so we offered uh, joint study programs for a ma uh, master study that one year in Ukraine, one year in Slovakia, and then stay in Slovakia or leave to, to, to the West or come back home. Not a direct brain drain, but somehow sophisticated. After three years, I was asked by the president of IT Association of Ukraine, IT Ukraine, Mario, come here. So, not anymore, because we are Ne we do need our own people here because Ukraine was growing very fast with uh, IT outsourcing. Today, I think, is number four in the world uh, with the ICT outsourcing. So they said, don't do anything else. Just, okay, continue with your master study programs. This is not, not a big issue, so go on. Last year in December, there was a huge conference in Ukraine, in Kiev, uh, before the war in December, where the, the chiefs of ICT industry with the ministry, ministers and, and the prime minister and academia sit down and they recognize, they said that although we produce 25,000 ICT specialists in Ukraine, we need 40,000. So we have to do huge steps in order to, to grow up. And they settled the plan. Would be interesting also for many, many of countries here. They settled a very sh short plan where they, they the government ordered to the universities to follow the orders of the industry. N okay, I would not say that 
finish of Academia Freedom, but they said, listen to them and do what they say. Otherwise, we will have big troubles. I, imagine this in France or in Slovakia also. No. Impossible, huh? So impossible. impossible, okay. So it's, it, it's better in, in French, the word. So they ordered him to do. Unfortunately, the war came. And uh, what we can do now is really to, to, to help Ukraine to do business in IT, so not to stop contracts and continue to support them, although it's a bit risky, I understand. So this is what we did with our companies, that please continue the contracts with, uh, with the IT Ukraine. Many, many thanks for this very relevant and real-life example, so to say. So we are five minutes before the end of the workshop. And so we, you know, I would like to wrap up a little bit. It's very difficult to do a full wrap up about all the things that we heard, but we will do a report, uh, relatively short and you know, to the point. And those of you who are on social media can also see that there were quite a few sound bites, so to say, there, out there. And I just, you know, I've done a few of these workshops before. I found it just quite amazing uh, that the density of, uh, you know, ideas and, and 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 real life examples that we've heard so far. And for for me, this is just basically the beginning of a new conversation uh, because these are just you know valuable things that we will um, bring back to, to Brussels and put into this structured dialogue uh, that Executive Vice President Vester uh, you know, has started with the member states and with, with the stakeholders. Uh, but I'd like uh, to give you, you know, one last minute of um, reflection, saying like of uh, coming from the impossible to the possible of uh, the th all the things that you have heard today what do you take um, back for you, for your specific work? Perhaps one or two things, and where you say like, well, yes, today this opened my eyes for this, or I've heard this good idea, and I, this will, I will bring back and do in my concrete work. Of course, the MEP has the word first. Well, I'm, I really like this, um, this uh, idea of uh, citizens for, for the digital age, this idea of uh, inclusion, motivation, and understanding. Because at the end, what we are talking about it is that we really need uh, very clear goals uh, where to go, and we really need to, to, to have everybody on uh, in, in order to reach that mission. If uh, Now that we are talking in research about uh, missions and everything, and I think this is, uh, this is uh, an important way of, uh, of thinking, a good way of thinking, and a, a good way to, 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 to also to, to do our everyday work in the, in, the, in the parliament, because at the end we are working with uh, member states, with the commission, and with many stakeholders, and especially with the civil society. But uh, we really need to, to, to have these goals very clear, and um, for me that is to, to do this transition, but, but, to do it, but to do it in a just way. This is very important, not leaving anyone or any territory behind. And this is especially where we have to, where we have to insist because it's not clear and it's not easy to do it because of all the inequalities we have already in within the European Union among people, among groups of people, and among countries and among regions. So, many, many thanks. Samia. Um, I really like um, the idea to come up with solution to bridge the gap uh, um, in gender gap, <laughs> the gap between. and uh, not only address the issue by talking to the girl, but also talking to the boys. Because in fact, uh, to break down the stereotypes, we have to work uh, closely with the, all the stakeholders in a, in, a, in a society, and stakeholders in society is women and men. And if we want more women in the digital sector, we have, uh, t in fact, to, uh, to, to inform them, to present them with role models, to, uh, to help them to understand uh, what, what means digital. It's not only something that it's called and uh, we are co working in coding school or something like that. It could be meaningful. It could be something that have social impact. That's what we, t we told to the, to the girls, but we, we, we do, to have also to do something uh, uh, specifically to the boys, because um, uh, boys need also to understand that um, in this sector they have to work with women. They also have to to come on to um, uh, to give them a place to be able to to learn and to work with them. Absolutely, thanks, Mario. Last words. Yeah, of course we are very much open. Uh, we, I said, uh, we in ICT companies in Slovakia, Czech Republic, wherever, we pay more to the women than to men. It's no equality, more. We need them more than the men. So for sure we will uh, support it. 
Uh, but uh, let me also thank to the European Commission that uh, as of, I think, 2011, we, we discuss and cooperate on e-skills project and all the other projects like digital skills and job platform, which uh, brings the digital more and more important uh, towards the uh, member states. In this case, I would really emphasize that maybe Commission can push more. I know that this academia freedom and all this, uh, this um, these words are here, but uh, if you see huge differences, how the academia e effectiveness is there in member states, so that maybe even the, with the digital, with the digital tools, digital communication, we should more put more pressure on on the member states that if they will not recognize digital being important, they will have all troubles with the hoaxes and today miscommunication. Uh, unfortunately, we see the Slovakia. For some reason, 50% of people is able. They say that yeah, they believe in hoaxes because the, this looks nicer and easier to understand the message than the complicated issues. Yeah, complicated issues are usually harder to understand, of course, and uh, but usually they are more true. So thanks to you, to organizers, to invited us that for this meeting, and let's continue. Many, many thanks. I mean, that's the thing that we can do. We can bring the people together. Um, we have also, of course, our digital skills and jobs platform, which is the online platform to bring not only citizens uh, to digital skills and trainings and learnings, but it's also a bit like B2B to all the, the good uh, souls in Europe who actually are on a daily basis active in all their jobs and all their roles in making sure that we have uh, more skills uh, Europeans, more skilled Europeans. And we're also working, of course, uh, through our Digital Europe program, where we uh, we have already done a number of actions uh, in terms of training, you know, master courses, but also um, short-term trainings. And the ideas that we got today, we will definitely also put that into the work program for 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 the next years. You know, I already mentioned the structural di structural dialogue. Of course, that is also something that will be really informed by what we've heard uh, today. Day, um, together with you. So really stay tuned also on what's happening uh, on, the, on the platform. Those of you who's, who are not yet part of our community, just drop, drop your business card here. We'll keep you posted. Um, and I think we have all collectively achieved what we wanted to achieve today. Many of good ideas, a little bit of good mood, lots of work. It's a bit hot in here, but I'm reasonably happy. Are you happy too? Yeah. So <laughs> bon appétit and see you next time. Digital transformation impacts how we live, work and learn. Technologies can help us to recover from the pandemic, but we need digital talent to make the most of them. If you agree, visit the Digital Skills and Jobs platform, the home of European initiatives on digital skills and jobs. Together with the Digital Europe program and the Digital Skills and Jobs Coalition, the platform fosters European expertise in advanced digital technologies. It will help you to digitally upskill yourself, your employees, students, or people in your community. The platform offers training and funding opportunities, national and EU actions, good practices and resources, data and insights, an active community, news and events, and much more. To put it simply, the platform helps you find what you need and connects you with whom you need. Join the community and contribute to building the home of digital skills in Europe. <laughs>